Tonight, we're in Edinburgh on the day the long-awaited tram extension starts running in the city. That's a hot topic here, along with housing and tourism. And our other regular subjects, the constitution, the cost of living crisis and education. So what will the audience want to talk about here tonight in Edinburgh? Let's find out. Welcome to Debate Night. Welcome to Debate Night, the only show in Scotland giving you the chance to ask the questions that matter to you. Answering them on our panel this evening. From the SNP, Ben McPherson is the MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith and was tipped as a possible leadership contender. He was the Minister for Social Security and Local Government but stood down as part of the ministerial shake-up earlier this year. Sarah Boyack is the Scottish Labour MSP for Lothian and the party spokesperson for Net Zero, Energy and Just Transition. Sarah previously worked as a town planner at the then lecturer before serving in Donald Dewar's first cabinet back in 1999. Alex Massey is a columnist for The Times and Sunday Times, as well as a contributor to many other publications, including The Spectator. A former Washington correspondent for The Scotsman and The Daily Telegraph, Alex won a John Smith Memorial Prize for debating. Let's see how he gets on this evening. Also with us tonight, musician and writer Pat Kane, one half of 80s legends Hue and Cry. He's now a columnist with The National Newspaper. Pat has campaigned for an independent Scotland for over 30 years and was on the board of Yes Scotland. And finally, from the Scottish Conservatives, Sue Webber is MSP for Lothian and the party spokesperson for drugs policy and mental well-being. Sue also has a weekly column in the Edinburgh Evening News and has recently launched a campaign to build a new train station in West Lothian. Please welcome them all to debate night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Edinburgh. It's great to have you with us tonight. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you are in Scotland. BBC DN is the hashtag you need on social media. Give us a follow at BBC Debate Night as well. And our podcast will be available for you to download straight after the show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night in Edinburgh comes from Tom Scott. Tom, good evening. Is Prince Harry right to say that the state of our press and our government is at rock bottom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, in the High Court, in his legal action, Prince Harry broke royal protocol by criticising a serving government, saying they were in bed with friendly newspapers to maintain the status quo. Alex Massey, is that how you see it? <laughs> uh, I haven't the faintest idea what Prince Harry is talking about there. Um, uh, it is no secret, obviously, that his own relationship with the press has often been difficult and equally no secret that the press um, in the past has behaved in pretty deplorable ways a lot of the time, uh, not just in connection with Prince Harry, but also with plenty of other people. Um, but the practices uh, he deplores, not altogether unreasonably, no longer take place. Um, this suggestion that the the press is somehow in cahoots with the government, by which I think he means Rishi Sunak's government rather than Hamza Yousaf's, um, uh, is, is baffling, frankly. Um, the, uh, you know, he talks in general terms without making any specific charges. If you're going to, to make those allegations, then be specific about it. Um, so I'm afraid I haven't, I, haven't the clue, I haven't a clue what he's talking about. And Harry, I'm afraid, has become a rather sort of sad and tragic figure, sort of mooning around California like a... Uh, living the sort of half-life of the exile, like a sort of Duke of Windsor with an Instagram account. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the, there's a sort of sense that he wants many of the privileges of royal status without having to endure the obligations that have traditionally, customarily come with that status. And his ongoing row with uh, the government uh, and with the press is, is perhaps part of that. Tom, let me go back to you. You asked the question. How do you see this? I think it's a bit unfair to have a go at Harry. Um, I think you should try well, and deal with it. his points. <laughs> you were having a go at him. And really, I think he's making a fundamentally correct point because the UK government is backed up. I know that the press attacks the government sometimes, but not nearly enough. Yeah. Well, that's when you, when that... you compare the attacks on the Scottish government by the newspapers in Scotland, which are overwhelmingly unionists, with the attacks on the British government, you can see that the Scottish government is held to account <laughs> all too much, actually, whereas uh, so, so the UK really, government <laughs> gets away with, well, with a lot of corruption and 
they are not held to account. They're not even held to account by the Labour Party. And I think <laughs> Harry has... It, it's easy to have a go at him, but I think he's actually uh, made an extremely important point that the okay. press... And it, what he also said was that the press and the government were bedfellows. Right. They were... Yeah, 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 sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex yeah. Masson, come the, back on that. The gentleman's complaint is that newspapers don't print things that he likes or agrees with. Well, that's his no, prerogative, no, but, uh, but, you know, that's not how the, how the system works. The doesn't print things I agree with, that's for sure. All right, OK. <laughs> Let me take this round the rest of the panel, fascinating as this is between you two. <laughs> Pat Keane, do you see the UK government and the press being bedfellows in this arrangement that Prince Harry says they've developed? I am ambivalent, right, because I quite like groovy eco Charles and I quite like woke woke Harry with his extremely amazing wife. So, so the whole idea of a progressive monarchy quite pleases me. On the other side, I believe fundamentally that the job of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, as Christopher Hitchens once said. And if, if, if Harry sets a precedent that shuts down investigative uh, press freedom of the elite, I don't think that will be a good thing either. So, but, but listen, the royal family is a media spectacle. It has been a media spectacle since Sir Walter Scott organised a procession down this road about 100 and 200, 200 odd years ago. It's, a, it's an orchestration. It's the enchanted glass, as Tom Nairn once put it. It's the mirror in which we look at ourselves and, and imagine that we have a kind of continuity with the past, a historical connection with the ancientness of a particular nation. And if you fall for that, you're, all, you're, you're basically a mug. Uh, and media only amplifies what, what is basically a wrong, non-Republican, non non-civic relationship with, with the royals who use the media to cement that, to cement their symbolic power, basically. Let's see what the audience think. Yeah, yes, on you go. I mean, I was thinking about Gary Lineker and the way that the, the media sort of home in on something which is fundamentally supporting the government's wish for the BBC to be impartial, so-called impartial, but to really to promote their point of view. And you see it all the time. I mean, you know, over immigration, things like that. I mean, the press pick, pick on, on topics that support the government's mm -hmm. point of view. Thank you. And Lady with the Spectacles, up here. Yeah. Um, just to raise another point, it's not the first time uh, recently that the British media has been um, accused of being um, somewhat less than impartial and somewhat um, selective about what is newsworthy, um, accused of closing ranks perhaps. Um, I think it was the um, American media that broke the story about uh, the British uh, journalist Nick Cohen <coughs> and his alleged sexual misconduct and um, that was a story that was really, I think, picked up in <coughs> British media. So okay. again, I think it was an accusation of closing ranks Thank um, you. in the British media. Sue Webber. It's not something I would recognise that the media is in bed with the particular UK government, not sitting from where we sit. We f I feel that there's as much spotlight on the Conservative Party and the challenge on some of their decisions as there are on the SNP government in Scotland. Uh, it, we're in Scotland with exposed to Scottish media outlets, so it might seem that there's more of a focus on the SNP performance, but I think down south well, there is equal... we can see both, from our perspective, yeah, we can see both. I, I can we? see both, and Harry's brave to be taking the approach that he's taken. I didn't come here tonight to expect to talk about Prince Harry's uh, case in the court, and uh, it's not something I've certainly been keeping abreast with. It does cause very divided issues, as so many things do now that are topical, and it's quite sad and tragic to see it all played out on social media as well, and... It's, you do fear for him as an individual and uh, what this might happen to his mental health. I mean, he lost his mother when he was a young, young boy and he is, all intents and purposes, quite vulnerable. Thank you. Down the second row here. How can you say that King Charles' monarchy is a progressive one when he's no friend to the LGBT plus community? Mm -hmm. He really is not. So how can you say that? Uh, sure, I'll take that. I'll take that point. Of it. I don't really know his positions on the LGBTI, and I'm very pro LGBTI. So I'll go and I'll, I'll go and find out. I mean, the only thing I wanted to add to this discussion was, I remember the, uh, when when Corbyn and and, and his compadres were in, were in government. One of the things that was really riled up the establishment was that they were going to look at 
concentration of press power and the fact that all, all, of, the, all of the titles that a lot of media takes its agenda from are mostly right wing and are, and are mostly acting on the kind of ideological interests of the society. But, 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 so, but, 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 so that, the, the so press that, was so largely that, responsible for Boris Johnson's downfall, wasn't he, over party gate? No, well, Boris the, but the, pre the, pre the press Boris can Johnson's kind of... Downfall. I mean, it's interesting... I do like it when journalists get their teeth into a story that might be ideologically <laughs> against their paper's interests. So I do actually believe in the, the, the journalism as an estate that has principles. And when people see a story in front of them, they will follow it. So there's, there's, there's not much the wood can rely on in the, in the modern world. But I do think I would probably rely on a journalist with his blood up for mm. a story to actually be able to print it in the matter what his publication was. Sarah Boya. Yeah, it's quite a tension, isn't there, between having a free press and then who owns the press. So there's something about living in a democracy that we are able to criticise the press, but you also have press standards, which you know, can be debated, but there's still an expectation. And I think particularly with um, the media, whether it's television, um, again, press standards are really important. So it's going to be an interesting case to see where it goes. I mean, we have had other yeah. cases uh, challenging how the press have covered things. But um, I sometimes think, however much the press sometimes annoys me, at least I could then complain about the press. I could try and get a letter in. Right. I could use it on social media, where there's other countries in the world where um, they don't have anything like the kind of press freedom we have. So a big tension there, and we've got to focus on that. Ben McPherson, is the press uh, and the government, UK government, rock bottom? Well, I think, first of all, on Prince Harry, that, like everyone, I, I do believe that he deserves a right to privacy, and that's what the, the case is about. And I won't comment on the specifics uh, of the proceedings in court, but the, the issues that are coming out of it, of course, relate to the Leverson inquiry and, and much of the considerations over the last years. And the relationship between power and the press is an ongoing is one that's gone on for the history of our democracy and it's so important that government is held to account. I think where I have empathy with what has been said uh, and think is important is that the press have as much of a responsibility as politicians do in order to improve the nature of our politics. And actually, I would like to see political parties not courting powerful media barons in order to get support. I would like to see political parties challenging other powers that may have an influence on people's attitudes. And actually, if the press and our politicians within our democracy, as well as the public, all of us, show the collective responsibility for building a better politics, uh, and I think uh, Prince Harry's right to highlight these issues in that regard. Thank you. Uh, back to the audience. Lady in the tartan dress here, yeah? Just to go back to what you stated there, Ben, about that you believe that Harry should have privacy, I too believe that. But how can we give him that when he goes to get this privacy? The first thing he does is get a Netflix special and then release a book <coughs> and do all these other things, goes on Oprah. If he <coughs> wants privacy, go do it. <laughs> Don't say you want it and then splash yourself over every media surface possible and then fight the media and say, oh, no, no, you can't say that, though. So he can't have his cake and eat it. OK, I'd love to hear your views at home on all of this. The hashtag uh, is BBCDN for everything you hear on the programme this evening. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Sean Nish. Sean. Evening. evening. 16 years of the same government with ongoing scandals, continuous constitutional gaming, ongoing challenges with the NHS poor financial management and accountability. Is Scottish politics fundamentally broken now? Thank you. Uh, ben, back in March, you talked about the need for um, a democratic reset here in Scotland. Um, was that because you believe politics here in Scotland is broken? No, politics in Scotland is not broken. We have huge challenges to confront together and the strength of devolution and the strength of all of our engagement in our politics is really important in terms of the financial challenges that we have, the population challenge that we have, the restructuring of public services in order to meet the needs of a um, more elderly population, how our education system adapts to the challenges of AI, how we remain competitive in a global economy. These things are absolutely in front of all of us. So politics cannot be dead and the challenge actually in this next chapter of devolution, so we've had about 25 years, we're going into the next one, is how we move beyond the polarisation that has been perpetuated by different uh, perspectives in, in our politics and actually think about where's the common ground? 
Where's the common ground on the constitution where we can move forward? How do political parties work better together in the proportional representation system that we have in Scotland and that, was, that were people who voted for in 1999? We cannot be in a, a stagnated position. We just don't have the time given the challenges that are coming at us. So I do believe in a more constructive politics, and it's one of the reasons I got into politics. But I also think, sir, with all due respect, the way you characterised your question, focusing on the negative, not acknowledging the fact that we have many benefits here in Scotland that have been delivered by devolution that aren't available elsewhere in the UK, is, is part of our collective problem. Rather than criticising each other, let's be constructive, rather than being tribal, let's work together on how we move forward. So that's the sort of politics I believe in. That's the sort of politics I think Scotland wants and needs. And the challenge for politicians as a whole and all of us in our political debate is how we move forward and deliver that for the benefit of all of us. Uh, and that's um, where I think we need to Sean, focus. Sean, convinced? I, I'm not, to be honest, because I'm all for collaborative politics. And I think, you know, that's the only way forward. But to be honest, I've lived in Scotland for 35 years. And, you know, certainly, over the last 20, I'd say it's got worse. I don't, th I don't think politics in Scotland is fit for purpose. We need a reset. I need to like, start working together because it's just it's too much petty party politics. Uh, uh, and for you, what would that reset be? I, th I think we need to look at the composition of the parliament because I think at the moment, I know it was originally designed to be coalition politics, working together for whatever reason. That's not, not happened. And I think that's part of the issue because we've seen it before. We've seen it in England, we've seen it in other countries. If you get a single party dominating over a prolonged period of time, you know, you don't, you don't get debate, you don't get, you don't get progression, you just get the same on, on a very narrow sort of focus. Thank you. Sarah Boyack, we heard uh, in the last week from Gordon Brown and other senior Labour politicians this new campaign for political reform. Do you believe politics in Scotland is fundamentally broken? That it needs that kind of change? I think there's two things we need. One is that we need a better government, and I think part of this is just really poor uh, governance. You know, if you look at our NHS, we're debating the ferries fiasco tomorrow. Uh, there's something about better decisions from government, and I think you're right, the SNP have been in power for a very long time. I think when you get into Parliament, there are good debates, there are cross-party debates, whether it's in the committee, where people can be very constructive. Um, and there are debates that we have where people will be positive. I mean, I think we're partly opposition, we're also proposition, so suggesting how things could be better. So I don't think it's broken, but I think the UK government really needs to step back because they've been putting pressure um, in a way that's not constructive. And I think we need, to, we need to transform the UK, not just Scotland. And I think the ideas that Andy Burnham had uh, about more power in our local communities, so that it's not just a top-down government kind of thing, so that you really involve our local communities in the kind of society that they want, and we empower our local councils and fund them properly. So I think there's a lot that needs to be changed. So it's not just that, it's not that politics is broken per se, but we need better government, and we as an opposition need to make sure that we are making the best possible case for change. And I'm, well, you're part of this I'm as well. I mean, they've beaten optimistic. you in the polls for 16 years. You've been yeah. a part to play in this as well. And I think there's a change coming, and I feel more optimistic than I have for a long time. Um, and that the UK is the next election, and I think there's a real opportunity for getting a Labour government that would be totally fresh and really start to reset Right, politics. let's put that to the test. Is there a change coming? Lady in the second row. I think there should be. I think the gentleman's quite right. It's been too long and you're too complacent and you're in government. Also, the idea that you think that it's bad that things are so polarised, the SNP and the Greens are the biggest culprits of division in this country. Oh. Just yesterday, um, Ross Greer tweeted that um, Douglas Ross was a bigot. You know, come on, that's not grown-up debate. Well... Well, name-calling doesn't do much good, does it? OK, let me go to the gentleman there with his hand up. Is, is change on the way, do you think? I very much think change is on the way. We're talking about, you know, 16 years of SNP government. Well, we've had almost the same length of time as the, the Tory government, and we've had nothing but sleaze and scandal after scandal, particularly in the last couple of years. I mean, two words, Boris Johnson. Pat Kane. Oh, I'm so old school about this. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the return of the old trope, too, pe too poor, too wee, too stupid here. Now, that's partly a, a, a petard the SNP have hoisted themselves on. They've not necessarily hoisted themselves on visionary policies. They've hoisted themselves on 
the golden thread of, well, of good management and good administration at a time when we face, what, five existential crises, whether it's, you know, AI or, env or environment or migration or, or, or warming planet or whatever you want to do it, or never find the fact that we have nuclear weapons on our soil. I, I wouldn't indict the Scottish uh, government for inadequacy. I'd, I'd, I'd cite them for lack of vision and ambition. And, and it's, I think it's a real squandering of the fact that I think the competence case was moved, was proved okay. about 10 years ago, and I think we needed to move on to a bit of futurology and see the mm -hmm. stuff that's coming down the road at, at, at Scotland. Now, I'm, with 80% of the finance and 60% of the welfare powers reserved to Westminster, I'm sorry, I am a bit of a what about it, as they say. I do, I do think that you're trying to do miracles with something that's fundamentally under, underpowered. But I look, at the, I look at the Scottish Government and its performance, and I think th th there was a, there was a, there's a solidity and a consensus that then could have been built on to do genuinely visionary things, tying the arguments of independence into it. And I'm really not a fan of sort of going back to kind of let's make devolution work. I mean, let's, the, 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 the Starmer prospectus is not shining and it's basically status quo, basically Blairism 2-0. Two, two we, we must hold out for independence to be a lever to be something better than that. Ben McPherson, because you said, you said again back in March it should come down a gear until this is all sorted. No, up, my, my, a, my, no, up, a, up a gear uh, says well, Pat, down well, a gear say you. Well, my, my, what I was saying is that uh, back in March is that I was not in favour of a de facto referendum because I was... I do not think that is a, is a strategic or effective policy in terms of international recognition and moving to a negotiation, a transition on independence effectively. But I do agree with Pat that we need to be visionary and that we need to push the utilisation of the powers that we have and the limited financial means that we have and be innovative in our policy making in terms of the, the challenges that we had, many of which you listed the five... Feet, the ice but but, but can, can I just... Can, if we don't can assert I, the independence case, along with every single future-oriented policy... For heaven's sake, they can't be, build a bloody ferry. They're not going to be oh, con on, confront the dangers of AI. Such, so cheesy so, so, rejoinder, honestly. So I, I, I absolutely but, agree with the, the need to be ambitious towards statehood and, and what that statehood would good, mean and would realise. But I do want to pick, if I may, on just some of the, the, the points, because the lady here talked about everyone's been responsible for polarisation and name-calling. And I, I agree with you, this is a collective failure and a collective challenge. But I, I don't think that actually helps us to move forward. I think we all, if we all take responsibility, then we can move forward the, with a recognition that we all believe in the common good of Scotland and we all hope and want Scotland to get better. We just have different perspectives. And I also think there's the, the exaggerated language, whether it's from politicians or in our political discourse more generally, does not help us either. We all face really serious challenges. And it was good to hear Sarah talk about propositions rather than opposition. And with all due respect, in my time in Parliament since 2016, we have seen far too much opposition for opposition's sake, whether it's been in votes okay. or in debates. So the collective challenge is what really matters. Ben, we, we Let's hear build you. a better we, we politics hear you. and make Scotland we the hear place you, we know it can be. Alex Mass is rolling his eyes. Well, yeah, because it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, this notion that we'd all be in a better place if everybody, you know, agreed to, to be nicer and, uh, and uh, you know, agree more with whatever the Scottish Government is proposing it's not what I is, said. is nonsense. It's not what I said. No, you're saying, saying that you, do, no, you I said deplore as a opposition. As a you deplore polarisation. But your, part, your party has spent the last 15 years accusing anyone who opposes its uh, prospectus for constitutional change of, uh, of lacking ambition for Scotland, of no, talking hasn't. Scotland down. No, it hasn't. Of of, uh, of suggesting that, uh, that those that. who disagree, with, that's why I said your party, uh, uh, of suggesting that those who disagree with the SNP's agenda uh, are somehow less patriotic, less uh, coherently or convincingly Scottish than the SNP, who have a monopoly on good sense, wisdom, progressivism and patriotism. And, you know, you cannot complain about polarisation uh, uh, after the SNP's record over the last dozen years. Mm. That's not to say that they're the only people guilty of this, of course not. But the question, uh, if we go back to that, is, is Scottish politics broken? Well, in one sense, no more so than elsewhere, particularly in the United Kingdom. You know, in London, we have a Conservative government that has been in power, or a Conservative party that's been in power for more than a dozen years and is at the end of its natural life, uh, clapped out, fatigued, devoid of inspiration and new ideas. <laughs>
And we have exactly the same here in Edinburgh with an SNP uh, party that has been in, in government for even longer. And so a certain cleansing has to take place before people can, can move forward and new ideas have to come in, into play and they have to be led by new people in government because that's how the process is supposed to work. Where the system is broken in Scotland to some extent is because we have such polarisation on the constitutional question, um, it is very difficult for people to move beyond that. And that has also led to a situation where there's been a break uh, in the link between performance in government and accountability for that performance. So the Scottish government has licence in certain respects to fail and fail repeatedly across a wide range of its devolved responsibilities without actually paying a price for that failure at the ballot box. Now, people are, of course, entitled to say that independence is more important than the NHS, than education, than transport or anything else. But for as long as that remains the case, then that link between accountability and performance is, is shattered and it is very difficult to move on. Um, so if Scottish politics is broken, and I don't think it is necessarily more broken than elsewhere in the UK, then that is the primary reason for that breakage. Well, we, we, we need a test coming up in Rutherglen um, fairly soon. Man in the Navy over there. It was just more to say that, in part, the incumbent government of Scotland has, you know, you talk about kicking it up a gear. Um, it's not shown a map to kick it up a gear. And the objective failure on pretty much a wide range of, if, if not every portfolio, um, on, has, has ridiculously have, have, strange have they been, why are we expecting, so just finish that But why are we bit. expecting a nation to perform as a nation state when it is a devolved unit? Okay, I mean, just finish, well, yeah, just, finish just your With the devolved powers that, that, that have been given in addition to the Smith Commission, um, the electorate have not seen progress. So how can you see progress to grander ideas when the basics cannot be completed in even a, a fundamental manner? Back in. We don't have a grasp of the basics. That's the, 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 I mean, independence is not a constitutional issue. It's a policy issue. Do we have the powers of a treasury? Do we have the powers of taxation? Do we have the powers of welfare? Do we have the powers of industrial development? Do we have the powers of cultural development? I mean, God, I mean I'm... I'm infuriated uh, because I think that it's, that there's a hobbling. Uh, that, the reason why you buy into independence for the last 30 years is because you can see the requirement for full autonomy, which is known in the world as nation state independence. You're not arguing for it because you're some romantic. You're arguing for it because, we, number one, you want to be rid of nuclear weapons and you want to develop the country properly. So I would like us to get back to an intimate tying between the policies, that will, visionary policies, that will help us survive for the rest of the 21st century, and the fact of independence. So, Sue so, so Webber, is, this, is Alex right? Is this all about the constitutional question at the end of the day, pulling the rug from everything else? We have to remember that the Scottish Parliament is one of the most powerful dev devolved parliaments that there already is in the, in the world. We have so many uh, levers and powers that we can be using right now. And to draw back to some of the failures, I mean, education is something we should be and we once were really, really proud of, and now we are not in that place where we should be. I think we are letting our young people down. And uh, I, healthcare, again, is another matter that, you know, we, we, we've been able to make decisions around healthcare for such a long time, and we've been making the wrong decisions. Can I, for the SNP, during their leadership election, we saw how divided they were as a party in terms of their approach to how they might tackle some of the issues. Maybe that's caused the impasse. The only thing that brings them together is the cause of independence. There's nothing else that drives them to make, have a position on anything, which is why they've been unable to take decisions, the big decisions that have been needed for the country to move forward. Okay, gentlemen on the front row down here. The issue with what you just said, because the, the Scotland doesn't have the powers, they don't have the money, because Westminster is in charge of all this. And we get absolutely, and you're, if we were in, completely in charge of more, you're seeing the most powerful uh, parliament in the world. Where, where are all the powers that were promised from the 2014? Where we are have they? The, we have yeah. the opportunity now to raise tax. We have the opportunity for Ought welfare. Or to cut it. We, we, they are there. <laughs> and, I, I, and I'm struggling. If you read some of the decisions, the, the government is taking now to keep continually give stuff away as a, for electoral pledges. It's going to come back and bite us, frankly, and we're going to be in trouble. Not because we don't have the money. We're getting the biggest block grant, the biggest settlement from ever. But why should Scotland get a block grant? Why shouldn't they have their own money to distribute for the National Health Service? 
everything like that, we would have absolutely a lot more money for independence. You Sarah, wouldn't. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah I'm afraid you wouldn't. Yeah, I think part of the problem is that there are some really big wastages of money. We've talked. To, I, I mentioned ferries, but if you look at the health service, we're now paying something like five hundred million pounds a year for short-term staff because we haven't got enough nurses, we haven't got enough allied professionals, and we've not, we're not keeping our doctors in the NHS. So there's some day, the day job of running the country, supporting young people. Young people now have to wait not just months, but sometimes years for getting mental health support, and that wrecks their education. So there's something about the day job in Scotland. And we have got more powers than we had in 99, significantly. You know, Ben was uh, Social Security Minister, we've got new tax powers, mm -hmm. and we should be focusing on how we can improve our country. I agree with you, Pat. Oh, well, we need to be visionary, we need to be imaginative, we need to talk about what we could do. We have so many powers that are not being used and part of it is not getting the heavy lifting from government. It's not good enough just to have good headlines. You've got to make sure that the policies are delivered on the ground okay, let, and that let, people's let, lives let are going to be improved. Let me hear from more people in the audience. Lady in the white top. There. Yeah. The original question was, is politics broken? And then we've spoken a lot about the need to find common ground. Personally, I think we're approaching the point where the common ground is the fact that our house is on fire, and we're rapidly approaching a point where all of the other things that we've listed, education, healthcare, etc., will become second-order priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, I would maybe make the case that politics may in fact be broken if our elected representatives, either in Westminster or in Holyrood, prioritise profit over planet in many cases. On the one hand, Go on. Uh, on the one hand, we've declared a climate emergency, and on the other hand, we're still opening new oil fields. How does that tally up? Okay. Doesn't work. Thank you, thank you. Um, your views on all of that from home, the hashtag is BBCDN. This is our final show before the summer break, but we're back with you uh, in September. Watch the website for details of where we're going to be in the autumn run of the show. Let's go to our third question of the night, which comes from Noel Tomney. No, evening. Um, can Scotland influence the opportunities and threats posed by artificial intelligence, or are we essentially just bystanders? Uh, thank you. So Scotland's Innovation Minister Richard Lockhead has called for a four-nation summit on this. William Hague, former Conservative leader, uh, said this week AI is the greatest opportunity but also the deadliest threat ever in our lifetime. Pat Keane, are you mm. optimistic or are you terrified? I've been by dreaming AI? of this moment mm. for most of my adult life. As a, musicians love technology, we make technology do beautiful things. We don't have an alienated relationship with technology. Uh, and the artistic life is upon us, ladies and gentlemen, if we use these machines properly. I mean, and, and the point about it is, is actually what's quite interesting about AI is that it takes what um, David Graeber, uh, pardon my French, but the famous anarchist David Graeber called bullshit jobs, jobs that seem to have no purpose or meaning. These are the ones that are going to be most at risk. And people at either end of the spectrum, people who just want to be expressive or just care or, or, or the, the other people who want to just uh, do hands-on work or craft work, these are the people who will survive this moment, we're actually at a moment of great liberation. What can Scotland do in relation to this? Well, with the powers of independence and with the powers of jurisdiction over your labour laws and your institutions and your welfare laws, we could actually look at these technologies and say, how long should a working week be? We can look at these technologies and say, rather than those revenues going to the corporations that are bringing them into our life, how about those revenues going to fund universal basic services and universal basic income? We're actually at the cusp of a great moment of human liberation if the citizens rise up and can see it. And Scotland and its, its nation-state capacity to build institutions that ride this future is absolutely in, but, but in the driving seat. How do we get control of it, though? I mean, Rishi Sunak's uh, advisor this week said it's two years away from the machine being able to kill us. It would be quite good to be part of the European Union, which is fantastically detailed on AI regulation. Maybe, maybe that would be a move to immediately empower us to deal with AI, right? so, except for not being where we are. Sue Weber. Well, it certainly got lots of opportunity, and uh, if you consider the opportunities the AI has to revolutionise how we may approach our healthcare challenges in terms of diagnosis, I think we really need to work much more collaboratively with business that's bringing this technology to the fore. 
The challenge we have with the NHS in Scotland is that they are fearful of working in partnership with business. They see them as a threat. And I think the expertise in the artificial intelligence within the healthcare and innovation sector lies right now in the private sector. So we need to start to trust them for a start and start work with them to really sort of uh, take the opportunity and go with it and see what can happen. It's endless. And to think if, if you were to sit for any length of time, even five years ago, sit and look at the opportunity that this could present us, you wouldn't believe it. Well, you wouldn't because the pace of change is absolutely breathtaking. And I don't know anywhere near enough of it to give much more of a comment than that, the fact that we need to be in, in, Into the audience, man over there, yeah. <clears throat> so your preaching's converted over here. I completely buy into what Pat and Co are saying around the ones of technology. The problem is, and many don't, people, there's still this mentality around robots are going to take over everyone's jobs, they're going to take over the world, basically. How do you get people to get over that mentality? Thank you. And lady down here. I mean, this terrifies me, and I hope that this doesn't skew the debate in a particular way. But, you know, people who are elderly, people who have disabilities, all parts, different sectors of society, really struggle, as it is at the minute, with everything that is online and everything that, you know, that is through artificial intelligence and not through human beings. It's a really scary thing. And if that's what's happening now, and somebody's saying that in two years, you know, they could kill us, well, you know, that would be half the population. Alex Massey. Uh, I think the question was, was what can politicians in Scotland do vis-a-vis uh, -vis Can Scotland AI? influence and control the opportunities? Yeah. Uh, well, not especially, but then nor can politicians or, or any individual country really do uh, much to influence or, or control uh, the future of AI, much of which is fundamentally unknowable at present. Uh, we're still in the stage where we are working out what we know and what we don't know about what AI might be do able to do. Do you think that really do. is like to be scared and worried? Um, perhaps not quite in the terms that she's expressing it, but it is reasonable to, to note that amongst people who really do know about artificial intelligence and both the opportunities, and Pat is right, that there are plenty of opportunities uh, that come with it, but there are also dangers. It is worth acknowledging that people who are genuine experts in this field think there is a non-trivial chance that it could end up being having a, a, a calamity, having catastrophic consequences. Uh, unintentional, unintended consequences, but very real and dangerous ones themselves. Um, but, you know, the people at, at Google, um, at leading universities around the world and so on, they are still working out how to come to terms with this uh, accelerating future. Um, and I think it is um, obviously the case that politicians need to engage with this, but it's very difficult to see uh, how they can be expected to lead the process at present. Sarah Boyack, can Scotland uh, influence the opportunities and threats with AI? I think we've definitely got to start thinking about it, and it goes back to the point that the reason we're having this discussion is because people who are leading experts in AI wanted to warn us about the potential dangers. So it's not that putting things digitally um, for our everyday lives is bad or using technology in all sorts of parts of our lives. It's about making sure you've got the safety checks and that we actually understand what they might be. And I think that's been the gap that it's not been something most of us have ever discussed. We had a debate mm. in the Parliament this week and it was a bit of a reality check for most of us because mm. we've not engaged in this. So I think that's the key thing. We need to start these discussions. We need to have it with experts. Digital inclusion is really important as well during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people were only able to communicate during the digital use and that excluded a lot of people. So there's something about making sure we actually consider all of these things. Um, and I think it's a wake up call and it's not about not using the technology, it's about thinking about risks. For example, if you're talking about it in the military, particular risks really have to be thought through. And then business needs to think through how it can use this kind of technology, but in a way that is safe. So I think the proposal that was actually made, I scarily agree with the government minister this week, I think we all need to sit around the table and actually talk about what are the regulations, where do we agree with the people that raised this just a couple of weeks ago, and make sure we've done our homework so on it. you're with Richard Lockhead on this, yeah? Yeah, I think on, we need to do approach. that risk-averse thought process because it's got a huge opportunity but given the people that warned about it, we need to make sure we've thought through what they told us okay, last week. Okay, gentleman in the denim jacket up there, yeah. Yeah, I, I think since, since before my time, we've been getting told this new technology is going to make our lives easier. And I think for, again, longer than my time, our lives have been getting worse. Like, we, these, these new technologies 
help increase efficiency, but that saved time is not something that we're able to enjoy. We're still working our five day weeks. We're still working, you know, two, three jobs to be able to survive. We're not, I think unless we have political parties that are willing to, I don't know, change the way that we look at the, the welfare system, making sure that people are given the resources that they need to be able to have a life that's not centered around work. I think these technologies are not going to make any sort of meaningful difference to any of our lives. They might make a meaningful difference to the profit margins of companies, but, but not to the worker. Ben McPherson, can, um, can Scotland control and influence where we go with AI? I believe this is such an important issue and the, the challenge for the world is in an interdependent 21st century is how, as has just been expressed, do we make sure that this technology improves the quality of life yep. for the majority of people uh, and isn't detrimental to our wider society, either through a, an existential threat in terms of it becoming more intelligent than us or f being controlled by a, a, a very small minority of powerful people or uh, influencing uh, a terrible state of warfare. But in, in all those challenging and challenges and risks, there, there are opportunity. And I, and I think we're well placed here in Scotland, indeed in this city, Edinburgh University is very innovative in, the, in this space in terms of artificial intelligence and, and what it could do, particularly in, in, in regard to scientific research and engineering. But also the climate crisis was mentioned and I would hope that we could utilize this technology to help us in how we tackle not only reducing emissions, but also how we clean our planet up and, and, and deal with some of the damage that we've created. Okay, so, okay, okay. huge opportunities, All but right. huge risks to be... Lady in the aisle, up there. Yeah. Um, I just wondered how we're meant to trust politicians to make sensible decisions and put the regulation in place for this technology when we've seen many other <laughs> sectors that politicians can, have... Can I say, can I say on that, that I, I mean, this, yeah. is for, this is for supranational organisations like the European Union and even bigger than that, to, to, to make sure we govern this properly. So it's a, it's a global challenge. And can that work, Pat? Are you convinced that it can be regulated and controlled? Someone was saying their politics is broken in Scotland. This is actually a rare example of when things aren't broken. Because, the, the one, the technologists are crying out for government interference and government legislation. Please set the rules of the game here. Yeah. And also, I just want to draw on a historical parallel. With gene technology in the 70s, there was a big conference called the Asilomar conference where all the scientists sat down and said, you know, if we're going to start allowing the cloning of human beings as we can have the cloning of animals, we're going to be in a disastrous situation. And actually, we've, we've been in a, in a circumstance where genetic technology has been globally, nationally and internationally regulated. We could have been in an island. We could have been in an island of Dr. Moreau moment where mm. hybrids and chimeras and God knows what could have come out of labs. But we, so it's actually possible. This is a promising moment for not government and governance doesn't get many big opportunities this is actually a big opportunity for wise uh, and sensible and evidence assessing governance to do its job okay uh, moment of optimism from pat your views and all of it what do you think the hashtag is bbcdn on social media let's go to our next question of the night which comes from mika dagan mika hi so with Scotland being a nation open to welcoming refugees, something that we see Westminster sort of not right now, aside from complete independence, is there a path to acquire additional powers around asylum and immigration? Interesting question. Thank you. Um, Sarah Boyack, is Scotland welcoming to refugees? Just to let's tackle that first part of the I question. I think if you look at the the opinion polls, it's not as welcoming as we feel it should be in some ways because we think we're very progressive. Um, but I think we've been very progressive in terms of welcoming people from Ukraine over the last year. And I think that's something we should be collectively proud of. I think there's more people, though, that need our support across the world. Um, we've, the climate change has kind of floated below this conversation tonight. Um, there's something like 214 million people live in countries in communities that are vulnerable to the climate crisis. So we need to actually engage in terms of supporting those people to actually give them a future where they live and to support them. So I think there's both the supporting people who've left countries where they've been discriminated against, where they've experienced political, um, you know, they've, they've been um, discriminated against, 
and thinking about giving them a safe haven. Um, but we also need to link this into the climate change for the future, because unless we do that, then the number of people we've seen trying to cross boats in the channel will be as nothing as to mm. what we will see in the future. Okay. Mika, what do you think? Um, I don't exactly think that you're actually addressing what I was asking. Really, what I was asking about was Scotland getting additional powers so we ourselves can actually be welcoming of refugees and those seeking asylum and not, you know, relying on Westminster to set the policies, you know, that say, um, and I say this as somebody who's, who, you know, recently we heard the announcement about student visas, right? And I know student visas are not nearly as important in terms of like refugees and asylum seekers, right? But I was someone affected by that. I came here because I was a partner to somebody who came luckily on a research visa, but we have a government, like a UK government saying, we don't want you here. And you know, people in Scotland, while I, part of the reason I am here is because the people of Scotland say, we want you to come here. Right? Like we want people, we welcome people. So there's a disconnect there, and how do we get sure. beyond? Sure. Sarah, just address that then. So, I mean, in Scot for eight years now, deaths have exceeded births mm -hmm. here in Scotland. We have a falling population. Do we need specific powers here? around immigration and dealing with migrants? Well, we have negotiated these kind of issues in the past. When Labour was last in power, we did do a deal with the UK government about students being allowed to stay on in Scotland after they'd qualified. I think there are issues about how they set the targets in terms of the income generation that you're allowed to do as somebody who comes to the country. If you speak to the... Um, the, uh, the sector that do hospitality, uh, we get lobbied a lot. So I think... We do need more people to come to Scotland, but we've got to do it in a controlled way. Um, and when we welcome people, we've also got to have the houses in place, because in our city, we do not have the accommodation. We've got housing crisis on a housing crisis. So it's got to be a joined up approach. And I don't think it's just having more powers. It's also making sure we've got the infrastructure to welcome people and, and do it in a way that will give them decent lives. Um, because that's, that's been something we've been looking at with the Ukrainians that have come to Scotland, making sure they get jobs, making sure their kids get access to school. There's a huge amount of work that you need to do behind that ambition of enabling people to come to the country. OK. Alex Massey, of the, the 12 nations and regions in the UK, Scotland comes ninth when it comes to attracting migrants here. Is there a path to acquire additional powers around asylum and immigration, short or different from independence? Uh, well, at present, um, obviously not. Um, after the next Westminster general election, there is perhaps the possibility for a fresh start and a fresh conversation on some of these issues. Um, uh, we need more immigration into Scotland for some of the reasons Stephen's outlined and so on, a falling, uh, uh, an ageing uh, population in particular, ageing more rapidly than other parts of the UK. There is uh, on long-term projections, which are of course only projections, but there is the possibility of Scotland becoming effectively the UK's granny flat which is not particularly attractive uh, as a proposition and not something that would be conducive to the well-being of the country. The Scottish Government, I know, have uh, in the past made the case for a bespoke immigration arrangement for Scotland, and I have a lot of sympathy for them on that question, actually. I think they make a compelling case, in fact. And with the devolution of social security powers and, importantly, income tax powers, you now have a distinct Scottish tax code that would make managing a bespoke visa operation that allowed people to come into this country uh, so long as they lived and worked in Scotland, but not in other parts of the United Kingdom, it would make it much easier to manage that now. And you could start off with a relatively small programme of five, 10,000 applications a year, ideally determined by lottery, I think, rather like a green card to the United States, um, and then see how that develops and move on from that. There is an opportunity to do this. It is in Scotland's interests uh, to do so, in my view. I think the current Conservative Party is unlikely to look favourably upon any such proposals, which is, I think, uh, regrettable. Um, but the Conservatives are not going to be in power in London forever, um, and there is the possibility of, of change coming, and just as there's a possibility of change coming in Edinburgh as well. But, you know, the, this is something where, um, you know, the consensus that Ben talks about and so on, I think, does have a role to play, um, because uh, we also need to look at why it is 
that Scotland isn't attractive mm. to people who are coming to the UK already. Mm. If you think of a couple of hundred thousand Hong Kong uh, citizens have come to the UK in the last couple of years. Very, very few of them have chosen to move to, to Scotland. Now, each of them at an individual level doubtless has good reasons for preferring to be in London or Manchester or Birmingham or wherever, but collectively that is a problem for Scotland and it's something that I think we need to look at more generally. Um, but, you know, the Scottish Government, the SNP are absolutely right to uh, talk up the uh, requirement and case an argument for more immigration into right. Scotland. Ben McPherson, why aren't more people coming here? Well, we do have net migration into Scotland, both from, excuse me, the rest of the UK and uh, more generally from, from, from other countries. So we are a very attractive place to live and, and, and Edinburgh has been particularly recognised for that. But we're not but, of the 12 nations and regions when it comes to Well, if people. you look at other parts of the UK who are in the same, um, uh, around us in that table, so to speak, uh, it's partly to do with the centralisation of the Home Office. And the problem is we have a very centralised immigration system in the UK. And actually, as has just been said by some of the other panellists, there is strong precedent in Australia and Canada for decentralising the immigration system. And when I was Migration Minister, we put forward very robust proposals that had the backing of the business community, the third sector and local government on how we could, short of statehood, bring powers to the Scottish Parliament that would enable us to to attract more people to Scotland and to uh, make sure that we dealt with our demographic challenges, but also were able to realise our economic potential. So I, I do think we need a new Scotland Act in the next Westminster Parliament. Whoever the main party that England votes for is the government. Uh, and that's why you need SNP MPs in the House of Commons pushing for more powers uh, and immigration powers for the Scottish Parliament should certainly be part of Let that. me go to the audience. Lady there. Yep. Yeah, just to say, first of all, I agree with what Sarah was saying, that um, we need to have the infrastructure in place. So it's not just about, you know, welcoming um, refugees and asylum seekers to the country. But what I haven't heard anybody talking about is about the people who are already here. We've got thousands of people that are claiming asylum here in Scotland, in detention centres and hotels and whatever. And they could be contributing to the economy. They could be doing a fantastic job to help us. And nobody... It doesn't seem to me anyway, that is actually fighting their corner to get them so that they can actually then start contributing. I don't know why we're thinking about other people when we're not dealing with the people that we've got here. Thank you. Thank you. Very down here. You, pretty much um, all that all you've spoken and said, we need uh, immigrants. So why, Sue, is your party sending immigrants off to Rwanda instead of bringing them up here in Scotland so they can contribute to our society? And while we're on the subject of the Conservatives, yeah, if you all want to work together, then maybe the Westminster government should stop um, interfering in legislation that the Scottish Parliament have already okay, passed. Well, let's, let's just focus on the issue, the question that we've got in the hand here. On that point, sending people to Rwanda, send them to Scotland, we'll have them. Indeed we would, but we have to ask ourselves, and it's something that Alex Massey said, is in the UK right now we have more legal migration than we had before, but these people are not choosing to come to Scotland. We are a more highly taxed part of the country when it's our NHS no workers. That, that's a deterrence. Irrespective of that, Ben, we have, it's a, in our health and social care services, doctors, nurses, they will come, to, they are not coming to Scotland in the way that the people are coming to work elsewhere in the UK. All of the legal uh, migration routes, those people that are coming here are not choosing to come to Scotland. So they're desperate. They are literally fleeing from wars and poverty and hell. Some of the laws in some of the countries means that if you're LGBT um, plus, you can be killed. Okay, they're fleeing all of that. Okay. So why can't we just bring them here in Scotland where they can actually Briefly, live in Sue. peace? Briefly. There's all of these very, very sensitive uh, and challenging situations you're talking about in terms of bringing people to the UK through legal migration routes are very different to what we are looking at when we're talking about people that are coming over in the channel on okay. illegal okay. All right. okay. routes. Pat Cain, route Pat to do Cain. So. hang on a second, Pat Cain. Listen, we just have to get, it's not hundreds of millions, it's thousands of millions of people that are going to be coming up from environments where they're being burned out of their environments because of at least two centuries of Western industrialism. I mean, we have, I mean this is all important. But let's, let's not forget, we actually have an ethical responsibility as modern people to these billions that are going to be on the move.
and we, ha we have to get used to the idea of a completely different idea of a society, not a, not a white homogenous society, but a society where we basically have to accept the plurality of people, that our model has burned out of their existences, and we have to, we're going to have to attack our attitudes at a very deep level. I don't think we have any idea of how much we have to change. So, so aside so from complete closing. independence, is there a route to bringing more of these people here that you see? Everybody, everyone's advocacy to, the, to an obdurate British government, whether they're Blue Labour or, re, or Red Tory, I don't know what, what's going to come in the next 18 months. Um, if you can make any headway with these guys, fantastic. But just be ready for the next, your children and your grandchildren to be living in a profoundly different world in terms of migration and multiculturalism than they have even hitherto lived under. And let's, be, let's expand our souls to deal with that, because uh, we'll have to. Lady, uh, second back row there. Yeah, on you go. Um, I'd kind of just like to bring it back to some of the concerns about students in this country as a student myself. Um, I've witnessed a lot of international students, particularly with recent um, limitations on international students bringing dependents and partners to the UK um, when they want to study here, particularly for postgraduate study. I think that's definitely a, a concern um, when it comes to particularly women coming from other countries. Um, and I think that it's also disadvantageous to this country as well because we need these people to come in to do research to bring our academia to the next level. Yep. Alex Massey? Sorry. On that point... Well, yeah, yeah, look, I mean, it's absolutely crazy that we have a situation where people can come and do postgraduate study, uh, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, where, you know, the university sector is a great British success story, um, but the Conservative government appears to think this is uh, some kind of a problem, um, and we then uh, kick people out as soon as they've completed their studies. I mean, that, that is so counterproductive and self-destructive, it is mind-bogglingly stupid. Lady there with her hand up. I run a barber shop in Edinburgh and I have a client myself who is from Iran and he came here to study and he published a paper on women's rights in Iran. He published this paper and has now been told by his government if he comes home, he will be sentenced to death or jail. He is now also struggling to be kept on at university here as he's coming to the end of his studies and his financial funding is stopping. Where does he go? He can't stay here because he doesn't have the funding, he doesn't have the visa. So do, what do we do? Do we send him home to be killed? Mm -hmm. I, I just think that in 2023, this is disgusting. That we have people who come here to study and then are literally, we're going, OK, go home and be killed. And, and, everyone, it's and everyone is a human story, of course, as well. I'm afraid we are out of time this evening. So much more we could have said about that and everything else here this evening. That is it, though, for tonight.